Bah bonjour déjà. Euh, C'est un honneur d'être ici et parler et ouvrir cette conférence sur l'innovation et le score. Euh, je n'avais pas prévu de faire mon présentation en, en français, <rire> donc je passe en anglais. Euh, si vous avez besoin de traduction, je pense que les casques ils sont là, dans la salle. Yes. So I'm here to talk about generation transformation, uh, innovation for a better world. It's going to be a story that starts with an unprecedented global ambition. Uh, innovation is something that you do in your lives, in, your spo in, in, in the sporting um, industries, but we're also looking at what innovation means to transform the world. So I start with a global ambition. Secondly, I just want to rewind for a second and give you a, a history of social change and why innovation and how innovation has boosted societies forward from fire and ice to nowadays with technology. Third, we're gonna look at innovators and the new tools that are available to them, particularly in the social space that didn't exist five to 10 years ago. And some of, the, some of those same tools you use in your work. I'm gonna share some success stories from my work and I've tried to match some of those success stories to the same tools and approaches that you're using, but they're doing it in the development space. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sports and innovation and the potential, the, the huge potential that you possess for really impacting society at large. So this started on, October, on September 15th, 2015. 193 countries came together, the member states of the United Nations. They came together in the General Assembly Hall in New York And they agreed, they adopted what's known as the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that would reshape society. This was years in the making. This was seven, I believe, five to 10 years, I'd say, of negotiations to come together with what these challenges were. This isn't only for poor countries to achieve, this is for everyone, high-income countries, middle-income countries, and, and developing countries, to achieve and set these goals forward. It covers life on land, life on water, climate, health and well-being, no poverty. So this is a hugely ambitious agenda. Essentially, those, 195, those 193 countries asked us to transform the world. They gave us a mandate. They gave us an agenda to transform the world, and that's known as Agenda 2030. One hour later, We invited at the United Nations Foundation a handful of countries and some private sector partners. To, we, we invited exceptional innovators to come and share their solutions. Because there was a little bit of panic. We know what we want from society. We know how we want to live together, but we weren't sure if we could do it. And we said yes. Those of us in innovation said yes, it's happening. So we invited the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, to come and open our summit, which is called the Solution Summit. We put forward an international call, and we had maybe 1,200 applications to come and show their work at the United Nations General Assembly. This is the group we had last year. But before I talk about those exceptional innovators, I want to talk about social change and why social change is important and how you participate in social change as well. Traditionally and historically, there's been two forces, right? There's individuals and groups of individuals that come together and they ask government, government to change things in their societies, right? An example of that is Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He led a movement for equality. Business, on the other hand, invents and innovates in two ways. They come together with inventions and then they invent and, and innovate across a value chain, across distribution chains. Right? So an example of that is Thomas Edison and the light bulb. Edison invented the light bulb, and he had it for a long time, but he couldn't overtake the candle. So he had to come up with the Edison Electric Company to overtake the candle. And once he had the distribution network, and we saw those light bulbs in the street, he lit up the world. Is there another way? So that's the two main ways we've done it up until now, up until five, ten, but 30 years ago. There is another way. There's bridge builders, and there's more and more of these bridge builders coming forward, and they take the best from the government space, the public sector, and from what's happening in the private sector, and they bridge the two. Those are social innovators. 
Social innovators are people mm -hmm. that understand both worlds, and they come up with an economically viable solution that has social impact. And there's two parts to that that's really important. Economically viable. If you think about what's happened in the public se sector up until present, economically viable wasn't necessarily part of it. We were spending money, spending money, spending money. So social innovators say, well, actually, we need to at least break even, if not make money with it. But it also has to lead to social impact. So that's the challenge. And that relates to those sustainable development goals. The toolbox. Now, this is something that many of you are benefiting from. There's new business models out there, new business methodologies that are out there. We start, it starts with user-centered design. It's finding the problem and coming to solutions to it. So many of you understand that innately as innovators. If you have the problem, the better your problem, the better you can innovate. There's B Corps, there's blended business models. There's a variety of new types of ways to have your business recognized and have a new tax status with it. There's new forms of capital available. What that means is there's impact investing. There's lots of money out there that says, we want you to turn a profit, but we also want you to have social impact. There's peer-to-peer, -peer, or crowdfunding. Crowdfunders, the crowd can now fund social innovators. The crowd can now fund athletes. There's philanthropies, there's high net worth individuals, and all of them are saying, we'll take less in return in terms of profit, but we want more in social impact. This is something to think about as sports innovators. Obviously, new technologies are a tool, from the web to mobile to big data. And all of this has added a layer and made things possible that weren't possible 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But the biggest thing in terms of technology that's really sent an earthquake is access. We're seeing now some innovation hubs popping up in Kenya, in Malaysia, in South Africa, in Latin America that weren't there before. And it's because of the access to new technologies. And finally, there's renewed political will. Like I said, from the UN Secretary General to national governments to European Union to regional institutions, there's political will that says, look, we want to help you. We want to help innovators transform society. And, it's, and they realize that it's not just about business, but they need innovation to transform society in the ways that we want to live. Now I'm just going to take you through a few of the success stories from the Solution Summit. So as I said, we wanted to really demonstrate that change was happening. And we wanted to immediately demonstrate that change was happening across the society. So we put out this international call, and we received applications from around the world. It was very difficult to select the best ones, or even, I wouldn't say the best ones, those that were already moving, those that would excite people. So here I've chosen a few just to give you an example of what's happening. This is Emmanuel Noah. He walks around his hometown of Accra, Ghana, and he sees in every neighborhood, this house is not for sale. This house is not for sale. This house is not for sale. And they're not for sale because everything is on paper-based records, which are easily corrupted, easily stolen, transferable, and there's no confidence in selling your system. And you know if you can't own a house, you can't access a loan, and you can't take the next step into, step into society. So what Emmanuel did was he took the blockchain ledger, which is made famous by the Bitcoin, and he started to use the blockchain ledger to register and digitize land records in Ghana. He's working with the government in Ghana. He's being financed by the private sector to digitize these records. Who's financing him? The banks, because the banks know that if you have houses, you can take loans and they can make more money. That's adding trust, security, confidence, and transparency in the housing system. So some of you may be looking at the blockchain ledger. Emmanuel's doing it for housing. This is uh, Renier Molel from the Dominican Republic. He's using artificial intelligence. He's taking on the challenge of communicable diseases. He's developed a system and a platform that takes 12, 11 to 12 different types of streams of data, runs it through his analysis machine, and he can predict where Zika, where the next Zika outbreak is going to be three months in advance. Here we've got a map 
that Rania developed for the 2000 Olympic, 2016 Olympic Games in partnership with the, Rio, with the city of Rio de Janeiro. What you see, the yellow dots are where he predicted, his system predicted the outbreaks of Zika. The red pins were the actual outbreaks. So this was a prototype test of the system, right? He and his partner can predict Zika outbreak with an 87% accuracy rate. You can see his partner in the background, Desi, one cool dude, he's like, dig it. This is what innovators can do, right? So, the, you know, why this is important and why that prediction rate was important is because governments are working with limited resources. So they can better target their resources, they can be better target their prevention efforts. Ida Jang, she runs a platform that's called Refunite. And it's a platform that connects refugees that have become disconnected from their families. In the movement, in the mass migrations, families become disconnected. There's nothing worse than losing your son, your brother, your daughter in a refugee crisis, during a refugee crisis. She goes into refugee camps and she registers first the refugees on mobile devices. She has teams out there registering. Tell us your name, tell us what you, where you're from, what's happened. Then they provide training on their mobile devices. This is on iOS, this is on uh, Android. They're soon working on voice recognition so you don't even have to be literate to use the system. You can speak right into the system and your voices are recognized. They train the refugees on how to use it and update if they move again to a new camp or if they go into an urban setting. And then they finally reconnect families. If you feel like crying, if you need to get some emotions out of you, check out their website and look what happens and look at the emotion of these families that have been reconnected by the Refunite platform. Ida believes that everyone has a right to know where their family is. And she's working day and night to achieve that. The last success story that I'm going to share with you is, is drones and it's biocarbon engineering. Biocarbon engineering, Susan Graham and her team of engineers in, in the UK decided to take on deforestation. There's about seven billion trees per year that disappear, wiped out, right? And we cannot possibly reproduce and replant trees fast enough to maintain the climate, the, the climate and the tree um, that we need. So biocarbon engineering is looking at using drones, and they're already doing it. They're using drones to plant trees, water them, and maintain a, a, um, an irrigation and a reporting system on them. Their goal is to do a billion trees per year. Right now, they're up to about 10,000 a year. In three, four, or five years' time, they think they can get to a billion. Her prototype is working so well that they recently won the second prize in Drones for Good competition, a competition that you would be open to as well. It's a phenomenal example of a small group of people taking on a big problem and doing something about it. I've got one bonus for you before I move on to sports and innovation. This one's really cool. We all or a majority of us, anybody that follows football or the Euros, um, 2016, we all were fascinated by the thunderclap generation. These group of Icelandic folks that came into all the stadiums and started clapping. And not only were they clapping, but they started winning. And they started winning in quite incredible ways. And they started knocking off the big talents of Europe. So I called a friend that works at the delegation in Iceland. I said, what the hell's going on over there? How did you folks do this? You know, a nation of 320,000 people how did you manage to beat and knock off the big ones? He said, quite confidently, it's not only happening in football, it's happening in basketball and handball and tennis. And they are the first generation to benefit from a policy innovation. Three things about that policy that succeeded and Iceland is an example of that success and something that you should think about whenever you want your successes. Think about the role of government and what's happening. They provided small stipends to families so that they could afford to get their children into sports programs. They paid and trained youth coaches. Iceland now has more certified uh, UFA coaches than England. So they paid professionals, capacity building. And finally, they built indoor stadiums because Iceland's in the north and they enabled sports and the practice of sports year round. Those three policy things, 20 some odd years ago, led to the thunderclap generation. They are innovation generation. And it's a phenomenal, I'm just
just checking the time. It's a phenomenal example of what policy and sport can do together in society. I just want to close real quickly and remind you and encourage you, and this is why I was so excited to come and speak to you. And when Arno invited me, I was, I was hesitant at first, but then I got really excited because it joins two of my preferred worlds. I spent the first two-thirds of my life playing basketball, and I had dreams of being an NBA player. But as opposed to being this tall. So I had to take those skills that I learned in basketball and go into the workforce. My belief is that sports and people around sports understand innovation. And innovation, it's all about collaboration. That's teamwork. Risk taking. If you've ever shot a ball, hit a golf ball, tennis racket, dove, it's about taking risk and failing. Failing fast is the innovation buzzword. Sports and athletes understand that intuitively. It's about iteration, small steps to larger goals, and it's about results. We lose much more often than we win, but winning feels good, and that's what keeps us coming back. And that results are impact in the social sector. I'm going to close by coming right back to this SDGs, the 17 SDGs that I talked about earlier, and how they connect to what you're doing. There's seven of them that connect directly with sports. So whenever you're thinking about innovating, think about innovating in good health and well-being. Think about announcing and advocating your results and what you're doing in this space to your local leaders, to your international leaders. They need to report on it, and you're driving that. Quality education. It's not about just about a, an education to learn how to read and write, but it's also workforce skills. Athletes learn skills to go into a larger workforce. It's about gender equality. Please, let's do something to include the second half of the planet that lives with us. More women everywhere. More women in these conferences, more women on these stages, more women in our boardrooms. Decent work and sustainable communities. This is everything about infrastructure. This is everything about the workforce. This is everything that will push your businesses forward and enable more people to do sports. You obviously are participating in bringing communities together, peace and, peace and security in societies. And I'll finish in partnership. Partnership leads to that teamwork point. We can do a lot more. Small groups of people can do a lot more together than we can do individually. Technology is facilitating that. These types of conferences are facilitating that. And we have to take advantage of that. That's the last goal. And think about all of those when you move forward. That's really all I've got to say. I look forward to learning and listening to each of your interventions and maybe charting paths forward together to achieve those goals of trans transforming our world together. Thank you very much for your time.